do you think, and it's all speculation, Dr. King would say now, if he were with us today, given the statistics that show that there is a widening gap between the rich and the poor, mm -hmm. that there are more and more people from the middle class falling into poverty, are we closer to the realization of that dream or further away? The way I look at it is that there's the good news, and that is we overcame something. I mean, I think people who say nothing was, nothing was changed, uh, you know, I invite them to go back to the Jim Crow era and live in Mississippi in 1955. Um, you know, it's kind of like saying we're still in slavery. Well, go back to slavery. We're, we're still might be oppressed, but a specific system of oppression was overcome, the Jim Crow system in the South. That was an enormous achievement. And, and I think we need to celebrate that achievement. And I hope next year with the 50th anniversary of, or I guess a year and a half down the road, uh, the 50th anniversary of uh, the Selma to Montgomery March and the um, passage of the Voting Rights Act, that was the crowning achievement of the overcoming of Southern <laughs> Jim Crow. And uh, lots of people died in that struggle. It, it's not often that you get a chance during your lifetime to say, I triumphed over a major system of oppression that had been around for a long time. And Martin Luther King understood the importance of that. But on the other hand, he didn't stop and say, okay, we won. I'm going to retire now. Instead, he understood that that was part of a larger struggle. When you overcome one system of oppression, you still have oppression. You still have injustice. You still have, it takes other forms. And he understood that the same way a Frederick Douglass in the 19th century would understand that, that he, you didn't stop struggling. Yes, we won the Civil War, slavery's over, but there's still major systems of oppression that we have to overcome. So when you say <clears throat> he overcame, we overcame, I'm thinking from the March on Washington until his death in 1968, what was accomplished? The overcoming of Jim Crow. I mean, the March on Washington. There Wash was specific the March, legislation the March, that yes. was passed when jo uh, after Kennedy's death. Yes, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which was those two pieces of legislation are key. Now, any system of oppression, you don't just pass a law and it suddenly goes away. I mean, but that broke the back of it because no longer the, the system of Jim Crow was based on it was legal to discriminate. So a victim of that system couldn't go into the courts, couldn't appeal to the federal government, uh, uh, couldn't get protection of the rights that came because of the passage of that legislation. Well, you mention, and it's quite ironic, the Voting Rights Act. And if you look at where we are right now mm -hmm. and the decision that the Supreme Court recently made, that very Voting Rights Act is under attack, would you say? It's, it was, it's been under attack since it was passed. It was under attack before it was passed. But the difference is, in the last election, more the larger proportion of black Americans voted than any other group in this country. And, and I guess the Attorney General right now is the United States federal government is suing North Carolina because exactly. of its... Under, under the Voting Rights Act. The, as I said, oppression doesn't go away because you pass a piece of legislation. Someone has to enforce it. Someone has to ha be brave enough to exercise their rights. To me, this attack reminds us that rights, you know, we, we passed civil rights legislation after the Civil War. Uh, a Civil Rights Act of 1866 guaranteed a lot of the things that the Civil Rights Act of, 18, of 1964 um, protected. 
But if you don't have the power to protect that and you lose focus on, on that you know, rights aren't just handed, you know, they, they have to be defended, they have to be, you have to have that constant vigilance. Uh, rights can always be, and that's true for everyone. I mean, you know, we have lots of rights. White Americans have a lot of rights that uh, get taken away if they don't uh, pay so attention. So where do you see uh, this latest assault in terms of rights coming from? In the past, one might say it was um, the solid South, solid segregated South and those who defended it. Right. So how would you de describe where the attack is coming from now on the Voting Rights Act? I think two main sources. One is political. One is the Republican Party. Um, and I, I say that specifically because <laughs> There is a segment of the Republican Party that believes that the best way to win elections is to suppress the vote. That is, if everyone goes to the polls, we'll lose. So let's try to think of ways making voter registration more difficult. You know, all, all of these uh, kinds of voter ID laws. Uh, the whole purpose of that, and it should be transparent to anyone, is to l decrease the number of people who go to the polls, especially in minority communities. And if you do that according to this strategy, you'll win an election. Well, I think they would say legitimately that people who vote need to show ID that they're properly qualified what, to why vote. Do, why do they suddenly discover this? They would what was say, the, what is the I, problem I would think that they're trying to solve? Because of illegal immigrants mm -hmm. who should not be allowed to vote. Yes. Shouldn't show, you show, then have people? Show me, show me instances in which illegal immigrants go and vote. Show me instances where somebody with false ID goes and votes instead of someone else. Uh, it, these are rare extremely rare. And I think it's, the statistics back you up. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a solution in search of a problem. <laughs> and, and that's why, to me, it's transparent. But I said that that's only one of the, re, the threats. And the other <coughs> threat, I think, is economic. That because we are a country that is becoming, where the gulf between rich and poor is becoming greater, I think that that in itself is becomes a threat to rights of, of various sorts because people don't want to be taxed to, you know, what what is our right to education if you don't have a public education system? What is a right to, um, you know, many of the things that that we would like to have? You know, uh, I think that's behind the whole question of health care. Do we have a right to decent health care? You know, I think we should, but that's not going, going to happen if there's a strong economic interest against that, who don't want to pay for someone else's health care. Uh, you know, you can make an argument that they do anyway, because if you don't have insurance, if you don't have um, a uh, government-funded health care system, people are still going to get sick. But the way this works is that they only get care when it's involuntary, that is, in an emergency or something like that. And, and you know, I would like, and many other people who fe feel that health care should be a basic human right, um, that, that it shouldn't come down to, um, if you don't have the money, you don't get any kind of health services other than emergency care. So does that mean you would support Obama? in not negotiating or using the Affordable Care Act as a, a piece to be negotiated? No, I, I, I'm, I would strongly resist that because, you know, again, if we allow a piece of legislation, suppose instead of the Affordable Care Act, the argument was unless Obama agrees to allow changes in the Voting Rights Act, ah. what, what would the response of people be? 
Well, uh, the Supreme Court has already made some decisions uh, that have weakened right, the but, voting. But the question is, Congress can correct those decisions by simply passing a new law. What if, what if the bargaining point for the Republican Party would be, uh, let's delay implementation. You know, uh, the Voting Rights Act passes in 1965. The next year, the Republicans gain control. The first time they gain control of the, of the House, they say, well, unless the Voting Rights Act is repealed, we're going to wreck the economy. We're not going to raise the debt limit. We're not going to fund uh, Medicare. So how is it that it seems it's the Republican Party that has become uh, that group that is uh, questioning or challenging the rights of all Americans? Would you say that? Well, to me, it's, it's a question of whose interests are being served. You know, when I, when I look at why people are doing things, that's the first question. I think that's the first question any historian would ask about. What, why are you doing this? What, is, what are you going to gain from it? And, and, and I think right now the Republican Party has, is facing a, a dilemma that, and it's, and it's been known for you know, at least a decade or two, that the demographics are against the Republican Party, that the um, immigrants coming into the country, young people, you know, the, the parts of the population that are growing are voting majority Democratic, that the strongest strongholds of the Republican Party are growing older and the proportion of the population that is white is becoming less and less. So you're looking at that demographic and you've got a problem. And it's, and it's the opposite of the problem of the Democrats, by the way. But the problem is, how are you going to build a majority coalition and sustain it? And one of the ways is to start, change your policies, so that they appeal more to precisely the groups that you... You, you would think you yeah. th that certainly is a viable way of doing this. There used How, to be a Republican however, Party that g got a lot of the black vote. Yes, People exactly. People like Nelson Rockefeller yes. or the elder Romney. Even Richard Nixon. Even Richard Nixon. I, I think maybe Dwight Eisenhower. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, most black people of a certain age, especially, used to vote Republican. Until, uh, when was it, Lyndon Baines Johnson? Well, a stronghold uh, party leaders to <coughs> vote for the Civil Rights Act in 64? Yeah, that was the, that was the beginning of a major change in, in American politics. Uh, it started with Roosevelt, but, but certainly the 1964 election was the last election in American history in which a majority of white Americans voted for the Democratic candidate. It hasn't happened since. And it's not likely to happen. Where the majority of white Americans voted yeah. for the Democratic candidate. It hasn't happened. So if what you're saying is the Democratic Party has been successful where it's been successful because of non-white votes. Exactly. There is no Democratic candidate really since Roosevelt who has won without black votes because when you think back John F. Kennedy won uh, Lyndon Johnson's 1964 election is the exception that he won in a landslide he won the majority of the white vote but that was the last time and that, that was happened. primarily because of the Vietnam War and Goldberg his opponent was Gold, considered, Goldwater yeah, yes yeah. Goldwater yeah. <laughs> was considered yeah. um, pro-war Pro, pro well, escalating the war. The Vietnam War had barely uh, reached public consciousness, but uh, Johnson kind of painted Goldwater as this extremist who might get us into a nuclear war with Russia. And uh, yeah, so he was able to win the election. 
but also in part because the popularity carryover from uh, John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy was the last president who was really, really popular among um, practically all groups of Americans. And Lyndon Johnson, to some degree, inherited that popularity and won this uh, landslide victory yes. in yes. 1964. But it really hasn't happened since. No Democratic candidate has, has really gotten that close to 50% of the vote, of the white vote. So, so we talk about how to maintain rights and to expand rights, one has to be vigilant. Of course, yes, yes. So since the demographics of this country is changing and there are more and more people of color who are becoming the majority, does that say anything about civil rights? It, it means that if we maintain that vigilance, those of us, you know, t to me, one of the reasons why black Americans vote Democratic is, is because the Democratic Party helped get the civil rights legislation through and, and so, and the Republican Party since that time has been seen as, as not necessarily anti-civil rights, but not as strong in terms of, of defending it. So, so that has brought black Americans. And then another accomplishment of Lyndon Johnson was the Immigration Act. He, he was the president who passed the Immigration Act of 1965, which took race out of the equation. It, most people don't remember that before 1965, our immigration policy was racist. That if you, if you came from Europe, and you wanted to enter the United States, you didn't have very much of a problem. If you came from Asia or Africa and you wanted to immigrate into the United States, then you had a real problem. Now, after the Bay of Pigs, uh, under Kennedy, I guess in 1963, Cubans, the policy was changed to the, allow more Cubans. The, the exception was that if you were escaping from communism, so, for example, if you were a Hungarian immigrant, you know, then, then Congress would very quickly pass a law. Of course, they were European, so they could prob many of them could have gotten in anyway, but not as quickly. They would have probably had to stand in line. But because they were escaping from communism, then you kind of go to the front of the line and you get in. And that applied to Cubans. It, it applied uh, later on to... Um, uh, Russian Jews who were escaping from the Soviet Union. Um, so all, all of these were exceptions to the rule. Uh, but the point is that today, even though at the time the 65 Act was not considered that important, it was kind of se considered kind of a so minor thing. So what, what, what did Johnson do to, to make the immigration policy more open? It, it was in the same it was in the same context of the passage of civil rights legislation. In other words, it was part of that response to let's get race out of the law. And it was quite obvious that the immigration system had been shaped by the desire, going back to the 1920s, of stopping immigration from China, stopping Im immigration from um, any part of the world other than Europe. And, and at that time, it was quite clear that this was, this, this was intended to keep the racial character of this country. 